In this world, you will have troubles. This is not one of the promises of Jesus that we quote as often. But Christ wanted us to be prepared, not surprised, that we would face real struggles in this life. As fallen people navigating a fallen world, we are sure to encounter sin in its many forms. A supernatural kind of evil, a brokenness apparent in society, and a corruption within each of our hearts as well. We even say things like, the devil made me do it. I'm naughty by nature. Everybody's doing it. But Christians think differently. God's word isn't just a map to heaven, but a strategy for living in a broken world. We must face the reality of sin if we're going to avoid it. We must learn to discern God's voice above the temptations of this world. We must learn the way of Jesus who overcame evil with good. This Lenten season, we want to develop biblical strategies for recognizing, resisting, and overcoming the world, the flesh, and the devil. So that's what we're here to do this morning, biblical strategies to deal with evil in the world. One of the great parts of my job is the interactions I have with you after. I get to prepare some thoughts and bring them to you that come hopefully from the scriptures. And then I get to hear what that does in your life. And I'm regularly reminded that you experience the scriptures in profound ways. That even if you don't have a theological education, there's things that come to light that you see that I don't see. And so a couple of weeks ago, I got a package um, dropped off in my, I think it was my home or my office. I can't remember where I got it. And inside this package was this. It's a chicken, and it said, a, a quote on the little note said, Gideon was a chicken. And the last ser- series we did was on a biblical character named Gideon and his reluctance to have faith and his, his um, hesitation to do what God asked him to do. And a simple joke around Gideon being a chicken, one of the goals I have to bring to you is, how do I help this story, this 2,000-year-old story, come to life for you. And so I have a story I'll get to in just a moment that maybe will unlock today's passage for you. But I want you to open to that passage. It's John chapter 10. John's the fourth gospel. We're in the New Testament. So if you're new to opening a Bible, it's about two thirds of the way through. If you're using your phone or an app, it's going to be even easier to find. Just punch in John chapter 10. It's important to note what happens the chapter before. The chapter before, Jesus heals a man who's been born blind. And after he heals them, you would think there'd be a celebration, but instead, a group of religious leaders called Pharisees, they're the ones who are in charge, they question Jesus, they interrogate the the person who's been healed, they investigate the healing as if, how on earth could this Jesus heal this man? They want to figure it out. And so the very next thing that happens is what Jesus says to them. In light of that, hear these words. This is Jesus speaking. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, this religious leaders, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they don't recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who've come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf come and he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks in the flock, the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired man and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. 
Just as the Father knows me, and I know what the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> I've had the pl- privilege and the pleasure a couple different times of visiting Israel to study the scriptures. And a couple of those times, we would be on a road, traveling from here to there or near an ancient kind of ruin of what was a, um, a, a sacred location, and we'd see a Bedouin shepherds leading flocks nearby. And it was this moment to realize while the world has changed dramatically for these young, often young girls leading these flocks, not much has changed. In fact, last century there was a theologian who was studying the scriptures and he happened to be in the village of Bethlehem, the same place where Jesus was born. And one night he saw the two shepherds coming in after spending multiple days away with their flocks grazing. The land in Israel is not incredibly lush like our land is. There's not enough water to support lots of grass. So the shepherd has to take them to the valleys and to the hillsides and, and, and all over to make sure there's enough grass for the sheep to live on. And so he saw two shepherds bring their sheep into town. And there was an enclosure at the edge of town that, <clears throat> that they led their two flocks into. And he thought to himself, as within moments the sheep intermingled. And he's thinking, well, how on earth are they going to know whose are whose? Whose sheep belongs to which shepherd? And so the next day, he sees that one of the shepherds gets up early and goes a little bit distance away from this enclosure that has one opening, the gate there. There's been a young boy who's been recruited to man the gate overnight, like an understudy, a shepherd in training. And the, new, the shepherd goes a distance away and just makes a noise. He calls to them, kind of a weird noise, but a noise that all of his sheep recognize. And at that call, his sheep and only his sheep leave the pen and follow him. And the, the theologian realizes before his very eyes, the words of John 10 became completely true. If you and I went to the neighborhood down the street and we're on a walk and we see someone walk up to a door, pull a key out of their pocket, turn it into the door and unlock it and walk in, we think it's their house or they have access to this house. There's nothing wrong with this. But if we're on the same walk and a couple houses later we see someone kick down a door or crawl in a side window or use a crowbar to pry something open, we call the cops because they're a thief. It's obvious. It's that obvious to the first century Middle Eastern community what Jesus is talking about. It's that obvious to us what's true in this story. This is a story about thieves and owners. This is a story about shepherds and robbers. It's not rocket science. And so here's Jesus being investigated because he's helping people. He's helping a lost sheep who's blind now see, and he's being accused of being a thief and a robber. And Jesus says, you've got it all wrong. In the ancient world, it'd be common for a shepherd to take the sheep outside to graze them for a long time to make sure they had everything they need because the sheep needs to eat It needs water, it needs food, it needs rest, it needs security, and the shepherd provides all of those things. Jesus says two really important things in John chapter 10. I'll throw them on the screen. First, he says in verse 7, I am the gate for the sheep. And in verse 11 and 14, he's going to say, I am the good shepherd. These are going to be our two central points for today. So if you're writing notes, write these down. We're going to come back and explore them at much more depth. So when Jesus says, I'm the gate for the sheep, now what I want you to kind of envision is how this would work, okay? In the ancient world, you would make an enclosure, especially if you were a shepherd, you would make an enclosure with whatever you had. And so you might be stacking up rocks over hundreds of years that the same enclosure would be used by multiple shepherds because you're out in the woods, you're out in the wilderness, out in the open spaces, or they might be that it's, it's a cave or it's a, surrounded by bushes, but you would try to make it so there's only one opening, and if you're out in, in, away from town, the opening would be provided for that the shepherd himself would lay down. So that there's no way in for a predator except through taking on the shepherd, and there's no way out for the sheep. They're safe and they're secure. And maybe you've been a parent and you've had a sleepwalking child. And you've had to sleep next to their door to make sure that they don't get out, right? That, that same kind of idea And what's happening here is Jesus is saying there's safety in the gate, or sorry, in the pen because of the gate. That makes sense, right? Again, we're not doing rocket science here, simple basic theology. So when Jesus is saying this, he's saying there's safety in the pen 
because of him. <clears throat> so there's, you can be, you're okay inside. The very next thing, take the second part of this. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, right? The shepherd's entire day is spent looking after the sheep. So make sure they don't fall off a cliff. Make sure there's not a predator around the corner. Make sure there's enough food here. Make sure we're not too far away from water. Make sure they all stay together. The shepherd's job is unending. Jesus is saying there's safety outside the pen because of the shepherd. So put those two things together. There's safety in the pen because of the gate. There's safety outside the pen because of the shepherd. Jesus says, I am the gate and I'm the shepherd. No matter where you go, you're safe with me. Because you're with me, you're safe in your coming and in your going. And there's, a, like, there's a bunch of theological insights here, but one of them might be for you. Your spiritual life, you think, is living inside of a pen. There's more to life, right? If the sheep doesn't get outside the pen, what happens? They starve to death. They don't have food. They don't have water. They don't have what they need. They've lived too much in safety. But if they only go out and never rest and never find safety, they're also unsafe. No matter where you go, you need Jesus to be your guide, to be your shepherd. And life is found in going and coming, gathering and scattering. It's not one or the other's. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, in the story, it's important to notice there's real threats like wolves and thieves, and both of their jobs to come, steal, kill, destroy, to mess it all up. Now, this Lent season, we're talking about the three enemies, the three sources of evil that we find in the scripture the devil, the flesh, and the world. The devil, I'm wearing all black today for this one. <clears throat> the devil's goal is to exploit our sinful nature to steal your life, to kill your potential, and to destroy your future. Now, some I know right away, when I talk about the devil, you've started rolling your eyes. I saw your eyes roll last week. You're maybe rolling them again. Why are we talking about this devil stuff? Is the devil really real? I used to kind of downplay it, too, and then two things happened for me. One, in my um, teenage years, maybe college years, I read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Anybody read that before? Really fascinating. If you want to, it, it, it's written, C.S. Lewis, it's written from the perspective of a devil writing to another devil. And it helps you just think about if the devil is real, what is the mentality of this source of evil? And the second thing that changed for me was starting to pay more attention to what Jesus talks about. Over and over again, Jesus talks about the reality of the devil, and the scriptures do too. And if the Bible takes the devil seriously, maybe I should too. C.S. Lewis, the writer of the, the screw tape letter, said this. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve about their in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They, the devils themselves, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist and a magician with the same delight. In other words, there's a, de there's a danger in giving the devil way too much credit or way too little credit. They, to, to be really curious about the devil or to say there's no such thing. This series is an attempt to be honest about that. Like if, if there was a threat to your car, you'd bring it to the mechanic. If there was a threat to your home, you'd install door locks and cameras and security systems. If there was a threat to your children, parents in the room, I know what you would do. You would stop at every no expense to make sure that they're safe and protected and trained and empowered and equipped and yet... The Bible says there's threats to your spiritual life, and most of the time we shrug our shoulders and do nothing different. We have no game plan. Our flesh is corrupt. The world's out of alignment. The devil's in real, and yet we take no precautions. We're vulnerable. We are like sheep without a shepherd. Here's what the Bible actually says about the devil. You might find this interesting. There's a bunch of different names or t titles given for this character. If you go from Genesis to Revelation, you'll see referred to as the Satan, the evil one, the tempter, the des destroyer, the deceiver, the great dragon who deceives the whole world, the ancient serpent, the prince of this world. Those are all the, the descriptions given about this. What's interesting if you just look at this list is it's not so much the names, it's that the devil really doesn't get a name, he gets a description. And the one consistent theme throughout history is that the devil, whatever name this shape-shifting force has, has one consistent goal, to destroy your life. 
The Hebrew word for, or sorry, the Greek word for devil is diablos, which means to slander and to accuse. Jesus refers to the devil as the prince of this world. Prince is a name given for royal power and authority. Remember last week, if you were here, we talked about in Matthew 4, Jesus is tempted by the devil, and one of the temptations that the devil makes for him is that I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, which should raise this really important question about politics. That the devil has a foothold in every single kingdom in this world. That there's not one political system or structure or form of government that the devil has not infiltrated and corrupted in some way, shape, or form. So if your great hope for the world is a political party or ideology, you're in strong disagreement with Jesus. Who says we need to be wary of every form of evil and every form of manifestation of it. Here's what the Bible also teaches about the devil, and this comes from a a book, if you want to read more about this whole topic, a book called Live No Lies by John Mark Comer. It's a really great place to start. If you look from Genesis to Revelation, you'll find references to the devil or the evil one or the destroyer or the deceiver. But this is what we can learn from Scripture, that the devil was created by God, which means he's not equal or opposite to God. The devil has a beginning and an end, and Okay, the second thing we can learn is that originally it seemed like the devil was not the devil, but the devil was likely an angel or a part of God's team that God would use. And and the original goal of the angel was spiritual formation, making them who God meant for them to be. But because the devil took it and became the devil, the goal is now spiritual deformation. Second, the devil is the person or the force who who rebelled against God's rule and has spent really the rest of history inviting people to join the rebellion, enlisting them for the great insurgency. And some of life's greatest or the world's greatest atrocities are quite likely because of this force has recruited more and more people to destroy more and more lives. The next slide. Interesting thing to think about from the scripture, maybe this will blow your mind, but the devil's location is not in hell. According to the scriptures, the devil actually roams the earth. The devil's eventual location is hell. And the devil's vision for the world is on earth as it is in hell, which sounds different than the way we'd like it to be. It's interesting if you look at Jesus' life, Jesus is actually confronted by the devil at multiple places, and every time Jesus shows up for the battle and Jesus wins. So in the wilderness, Jesus defeats the devil's temptation. When Jesus encounters a person who's sick or suffering and he heals them, he's defeating the powers of brokenness in our bodies. When he he teaches, he's taking on the lies of the devil. I think it's Colossians 2 that talks about Jesus making a spectacle of evil on the cross. That ultimately it's building toward this moment where finally at Calvary, it's clear that this is the battle between good and evil and Jesus wins and embarrasses evil with his suffering for it. And lastly, followers of Jesus, according to Scripture, are vulnerable to the attacks of the devil over and over again. It's pretty clear the Bible takes the devil seriously, and maybe this morning you're like me, who's thinking, well, I probably haven't really thought about it or given the devil too much credit. Maybe I need to think differently about this. Every single day, brothers and sisters are stolen from the flock. They're taken out of the sheep pen, because they've not let Christ be the gate of the pen, or they've been wandering without a shepherd. And I need to tell you just how dangerous it is. I want to just unlock something that maybe you've never really considered. I know many of you are troubled about the events of the world right now, and that the world seems kind of scary. Maybe let me make it a little bit more scary for you, and just tell you what's really at stake, especially in our culture in the moment. Many of you grew up in the information age, The last 50 or 70 years or so has seen a tremendous change in the way information is found and shared. It's now readily available. And here's the simplest example I can give. When my grandparents or children were, um, my grandparents were children, they had very little if no access to advanced education. And there might be in some of the towns where they lived in some libraries, but there weren't many. And in some of those libraries, there are these stacks of books, each one associated with a certain letter. Do you remember them? What were they called? Encyclopedias. Okay? Fast forward two generations, by the time I get there, my parents spent a good amount of money to buy a stack of 
encyclopedias, and that's how we learned, kids, okay? You pulled out A and then J and then, you know, is there anything for X? Sure enough, there's a little bit of X, but usually it's combined with Y and Z, right? Well, now, fast forward to our time. Has anybody looked at an encyclopedia recently? Okay, a couple of you, thank you. My son is a liar. <laughs> okay, or you found it. Look at this historical relic. It's in a museum. No, what do, we don't have encyclopedias anymore. Now we have Wikipedia, right? And if, a, a, a interesting case today, when Wikipedia was coming out, I had some friends, college age, who posted a fake def definition for something on Wikipedia just to see how long it would stay on, and it made it for a couple years. Information has changed dramatically. Well, it's true that many of you grew up in the information age, but I need to tell you something, and you need to get this. You now live in the misinformation age, where there is no shortage of lies. News and data are distorted for the advantage of big business. Personal information is available to the highest bidder. Social media, which we think we're in control of, is not, okay? We are the one being consumed. Is a tool used by advertisers, lobbyists, and the entertainment industry. Hackers, scammers, skimmers, deep fakes, and AI-generated images are daily counterfeit messages to a world with one consistent goal. Lie, cheat, and steal. Now, I'm not he don't hear me as an old-fashioned person saying that, that technology is evil. That's not true. That's way too simplistic. What I'm saying is, you live in a time where technology is a tool being used by people for evil purposes every single day. And if you don't realize this, your identity's probably already been stolen multiple times. There's not a day goes by that we don't have to think, is this real? Is this true? You live in the misinformation age. Misinformation has four primary goals. Let me make this a little bit deeper for you. It's to deceive, to confuse, to create conflict, and to exhaust. And the fourth one is the most interesting, to exhaust. In Genesis 3, where we meet the devil for the first time as the serpent, the scripture says that the serpent was more crafty than the other animals. The word crafty in Hebrew could mean a couple different things here, but it more likely means cunning, wily, or deceitful. The devil specializes in misinformation and has been doing this since the beginning of time. The devil not only wants to get you to doubt God, if he can't get you to doubt God, he's going to get you to doubt yourself. If he can't get you to doubt yourself or God, doubt your future with God. But the ultimate goal is to destroy your belief in any truth. This is such a poignant quote. Gary Kasparov, who's a Russian dissident, who now has to live in a country called Croatia for his own safety, said this. The point of modern propaganda isn't only misinformation or to push an agenda, it is to exhaust your critical thinking, to annihilate truth. And if you're honest, most of you know this is true. You've experienced this. You are so sick of this side says this and this side says that. I don't even know what to believe anymore. Isn't that what's happening culturally around us every single day? Yes? This is the goal, right? This is the devil's work to make you believe there is no more truth. You have your truth. I have my truth. I live by my truth. We live in a post-truth society. We've given up on the possibility of truth. So since truth is subjective or there is no truth, we've stopped looking to any source of truth outside of ourselves. Therefore, the only truth is what I feel or what I think. Therefore, my world is either very small or very selfish. And many people have done great atrocities around the world because it feels right or good to them. We are in a very, very dangerous time because we've given up on any sense of truth. Jesus doesn't mince words. Min, sorry, mince words. He says this is about life and death. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy I've come that you might have life. You're accusing me 
of being the devil, Jesus says, because I heal the man who was born blind. Do you know what the devil's up to? Do you know what I'm up to? The question really matters about what do you trust? Who do you listen to? It's been said, John Mark Comer makes this point, that the ancient threats to us culturally were violence. The real threats to our time now are ideas. Ideas that are unchecked, unguarded, unverified. Let me make this as clear and distinct as possible according to the words of Jesus. Let me make this into a table. For Jesus, the goal that God has for you is that you would have life and have it to the full. And the way that you have life is to live into his truth. To trust that what Jesus says is true. That the Bible is the guide toward living life. And the action required for you actually isn't really complex, but it is hard. It's that you would surrender to this, that you would follow this, that you would obey this, that you would let him be your shepherd. And if you do that, you have a character, an attitude of trust, that where Jesus goes, I go. When Jesus stops, I stop. When Jesus says, do this, I do that. That's what my life looks like. And the vision that God has for you is that your life would look like heaven. But the devil has a goal for you too that nothing good would come out of your life. That you would either waste it chasing the wrong things, or even better maybe, is that you would enlist with him and leading the world away from God. And so it comes by living lies. Believing lies and then living them out. And the actions are many. You can surrender, you can trust the devil, but most of us don't do that. Instead, we run, or we hide, or we lie, or we compromise, or we take what's for ourselves at the expense of others. And the greatest, most dangerous attitude of the devil is pride. I don't need God. I don't need a shepherd. I don't need a gate. I'm good. And the consequence is that earth looks a lot like hell. So what I'm trying to say, friends, is that there's a real active battle. And it's not against this political party or that political party, not those ideologies. That's way too simplistic. The devil has a foothold in every single way of thinking. The threats to you are within yourself, within your flesh, within the world around you, and from the threats that are outside of you. So what should you do against this shape-shifting force? Two simple things. If you're taking notes, write them down. Number one, recognize the voice of the shepherd. Does this sound like the voice of a God who loves me? Is this the voice of a God who's trying to invite me toward paths of life? Listen, recognize the voice of the shepherd, and therefore also recognize and ignore the voice of the devil. When Jesus says, be on your guard against the evil of this world, how many of us are actually on guard? I don't think many. Most of us are sleepwalking. And if we are anxious about something, we're anxious about the wrong things instead of paying attention to the voice. Remember that story I told you about the theologian in Bethlehem? How did the sheep know the shepherd was the one calling them? Because for years before, they'd heard the shepherd's voice. They recognized it out of a crowd. If you want to be safe, you need to know the shepherd's voice. Well, how do I get to know the shepherd's voice? Have you read the Bible recently? Is church a priority for you and your family? Are you in prayer? Are you listening and talking to God? If you don't spend time with the shepherd, you're going to be confused and think that other voice is the shepherd you're supposed to listen to. Now, I can tell you every single week, but if you just get used to Chad's voice, I'm not the good shepherd. I can only tell you the one who is. Ignore the devil. Resist him and he'll flee from you. The second point is this. Stay close to the way of the shepherd. Be in that consistent, constant, ongoing relationship with God. That's where strength and safety come from. If you veer away from God, it will put you in danger. Every single story I know from somebody whose life fell apart spiritually always starts the same. I stopped being in a relationship with God. And every recovery toward a relationship with God always starts the same way. I started paying attention. I started listening and praying and reading. So what do you choose? What voice will you listen to? Brothers and sisters, may you grow in your faith. 
May you recognize the voice of the shepherd. May you stay close to him and find safety with him in your coming and your going inside the pen and out in green pasture. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He is the one who leads us by quiet waters to green pastures through the valley of the shadow of death, prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies and is with you forever. May you know him. Allow me to pray for you. God, we're tempted at every single turn to turn away from you, to think we can do this ourselves, to chase, to run, to hide, to steal. And we just want to stop, Lord, and say that we're sorry. We're sorry for trusting ourselves more than we trust you. In this world that is so sideways and upside down, would you instead lead us in the path that you would have for us? Would you strengthen us, not by our own power or willpower or determination, but instead, would you strengthen us by your spirit taking over more and more of our life? The devil wants a foothold inside every heart in this room, Lord, and so we confess our sin, turn toward you, and ask you to make us aware, not just of your presence, but also your wisdom. Help us to hear your voice, Lord, above all the noise. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Would you raise up in this congregation, Lord, people to love their neighbor, people to raise up the next generation, people to take steps forward in love and service toward those in our community. Would we be an extension of your grace? This is our hope and our prayer and all God's people said, 